Joining us now, Jessica Valenti. She's the author of the newsletter on Substack, Abortion Every Day. Um, Jessica, <clears throat> it feels like you may have to uh, to up it to like twice a day. <laughs> yeah, um, every hour. It, it really is uh, nuts what's going on. Maybe we should just work our way um, temporally backwards because over the past uh, what 48 hours or something, we've seen new bans that have been imposed. Um, yeah. let, let's start with, with South Carolina because it'll give us an opportunity to both talk about um, sure. the, uh, the, the length of these, you know, the supposed lengths associated with yeah. these bans and the, the notion of exceptions, uh, because I think you really articulate a point about exceptions that we've been talking about for a long time, but I think you do it uh, very well. So l let's, uh, l let's talk South Carolina. Sure. So South Carolina, um, they, the Senate passed a six week ban last night. That's expected to go to the governor. Governor is expected to sign it. The, the goodish news is that it, it's going to go to the Supreme court. The state Supreme court has already blocked a previously passed six week ban. So this is like another effort by Republicans in the state to get something going. Yeah. I was confused about that. What, what changed? Uh, like what, what, what are they, was, was there different wording or was this they're, just. They're switching around like slight bits of language. They're hoping that the six weeks and that some of the exceptions will convince the, the justices who seemed somewhat interested in passing an abortion ban, but felt like the last ban was still on un, uh, unconstitutional. It's not entirely clear. Um, clearly Republicans think that this one is going to pass legal muster with them. Um, but it's just, you know, they keep trying and they keep trying. Um, unfortunately, this time around, the uh, female senators who filibustered last time weren't able to, to make that happen again. But they're just unrelenting, right? They're just completely unrelenting. And they want, both in South Carolina and in North Carolina, they want to talk about these bans as if they're reasonable, um, as if the exceptions somehow make it OK, even though, as you said, the exceptions aren't real. Right. So it's just a nightmare all around. Can, can you talk about the nature of exceptions in general yeah. from a macro level? Because um, for me, I have no interest in, in even engaging in that debate uh, because, as you say, they're unrelenting because they're they're fundamentalists and fundamentalism means that fundamentally <laughs> they are not going to compromise because god is telling them that this is the right way to to orchestra to to create a society um like just if in following this every day yeah. what is your message to our audience who might be engaged in the, these debates when exceptions come up like what is their role that you see in state legislatures in terms of diluting the real brutality of what is being implemented yeah exceptions don't do anything except give republicans the opportunity to claim that they are somehow being reasonable or conceding something right like it's purely a, a messaging tactic when you look at the exceptions it's not just the hurdles that are involved right with like a lot of rape, uh, rape and incest exceptions they'll make it impossible because you have to do these police reports you have to write if you look at a state like mississippi for example that has a rape exception on the books they did a study and they couldn't find one single doctor who would perform an abortion for a rape victim right and so they know the only reason they're putting these exceptions in is because they know they're not going to work and so when anyone brings up exceptions to me usually what i say is show me one person show me one person who's been able to get an abortion under these exceptions because you can't find them they don't they don't exist it is completely absurd and what makes me really frustrated is that democrats will talk about them as if there's too many hurdles, they're too strict, right? But they won't come out and say they're fake. They don't exist. This is complete and utter nonsense. The only reason that they're in there, they would never, as you said, they're fundamentalists. They would never put language in these bills that would allow women to get abortions. And when people bring up the rape and incest exceptions in particular, I point out, well, look what's happening in Texas, right? Where women are literally dying they're going into sepsis and they can't get abortions. If these women can't get abortions, do you really think a rape victim 
is going to be able to get an abortion? No, that's we, not. We can't solve rape cases in this country. We have the, an, a, an embarrassingly low rate, let alone the, they understand that any kind of investigative process would then time out this yeah. the ability for the yeah. abortion to happen. And that's what is just so frustrating for me about having to engage in this debate on their terms, which is why we shouldn't. No, we absolutely shouldn't. And uh, the other thing is a lot of it is about cruelty, right? So take South Carolina. In the bill that they passed last night, the rape exception says um, a doctor, before they perform an abortion on a rape or incest victim, has to tell that victim, hey, by the way, I need to notify the sheriff about this accusation, just so you know. They're writing in scare tactics. They're writing in language to ensure that victims don't feel safe reporting their attacks, going for care, right? And we also know, I mean, the big fear, I think, for a lot of victims, in addition to knowing that the criminal justice system doesn't treat them very well, if there's a lot of, um, I forget what state it was, one state had something in their abortion ban that said, if this victim was found to have made a false report, they could face two years in prison, right? And women are often <laughs> accused of making false reports by police just because there wasn't enough evidence, right? Doesn't mean it wasn't real, but because there's not enough evidence, they're gonna charge her with a false report. So there's a lot of punishment and cruelty sort of built in to uh, the exceptions. And we should say this also, um, in many cases, this also, these um, these penalties also um, involve the doctors. And from the doctor's perspective, it it creates beyond a chilling effect on the doctors because the doctor is not in a position to assess whether someone's been raped or uh, incest. And th when they make this decision, they are taking the responsibility that that it there a rape did occur. And if it didn't, they could end up in jail, lo loss of uh, of their license, et cetera, et cetera. So the 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 chilling effect is on both sort of like both parties associated with um the the abortion let's talk about the timeline in terms of like because i know in north carolina they mm -hmm. they passed a 10-week ban i think it is but it starts if if i'm not mistaken it starts um e, you know uh e, e, at at gestation as opposed to conception and my understanding is that ge gestation is actually two weeks is counted two yeah. weeks prior to conception yeah. And so when we talk six weeks con from conception uh, in uh, in South Carolina and 12 weeks, I think it's North Carolina, it's actually 10 weeks. Right. Um, hmm. can, can you speak to this? Sure. So I think that's actually um, Nebraska has that. Maybe North Nebraska. Carolina okay. has a different, has a, the same thing. North Carolina is also claiming to have a 12 week ban. That's actually a 10 week ban because they ban medication abortion at 10 weeks. And the vast majority of abortions in North Carolina are abort by abort abortion medication. Um, but yes, in Nebraska, they have this thing, as you said, where they're trying to call it a 12 week ban. Again, they're trying to make it seem more reasonable. None of this is reasonable. Wouldn't be reasonable with any restriction. Um, but as you said, it's not from fertilization. And so they're trying to play all of these word games with all of these bills so that they have the most extreme consequences, the most um, extreme laws possible while sort of, you know, not sort of lying to voters and lying to the media. And that's why I was really glad to hear you call the North Carolina ban a 10 week ban. It's so frustrating to see these bans described in the language that Republicans are using that is just so completely false, right? North Carolina's ban is not a 12 week ban. If 60% of the abortions in North Carolina are done with abortion medication and abortion medication is banned at 10 weeks, that is a 10 week ban, right? And I, I see this problem all the time where the mainstream media is really using the language that Republicans want right. them to use. It's the same thing with like, calling it a compromise, calling it a middle ground, calling it common sense, reasonable legislation, right? They have been pushing this language out for months and months and months because they know that abortion bans are extraordinarily unpopular. I just wrote last night, um, the federal ban that all of these groups are pushing now, they won't call it a federal ban. They're starting to call it um, a national compromise. 
uh, a national consensus, a national agreement, right? They'll do anything that they can not to call it a ban. Um, and we should also say like the, the, I mean, the, this is, these are just like opening salvos, right? I mean, there's no logic to them stopping at, uh, 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 well, before we get to that, yeah. when, when we talk about uh, the, the majority, uh, y- y- you made the point in North Carolina that um, it's a 10 week ban for all intents and purposes, because the vast majority of abortions are medical and there's a 10 week ban uh, after uh, medical abortion. But mm-hmm. the vast majority of abortions, my understanding, happen between six and 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 12 weeks. Is that right? The vast majority happened before 10 weeks, really. I think it's it's like 83, 84 percent. They're very early. Yes. OK. And so, I mean, what we're seeing, but six weeks, I think we don't see like it's it's they really happen between six and 10 because <laughs> yes. most people don't know they're right. pregnant um, until like week five or six to begin with. After their missed period. Right. Yeah. When, when they need an opportunity to then get let the dust settle, make a decision, make an appointment. And with yeah. a backlog in these states, that might be literally impossible. Right. The waiting list in a lot of places right now is is weeks long. So six, a six a six week ban is a total abortion ban. Yep. Right. It just is. And they know that. And again, this is all part of their effort to make it seem as if they are giving something up, uh, as if they're compromising, as if they're open to conversation. We're being reasonable. Same thing with exceptions. Um, it's absurd. And, you- and and just quickly on that, the, to return to the federal ban, because it's the yep. same dynamic there. It's the same dynamic there. Trust us. This is states' rights. We're going to leave it up to the states. And then what this is all doing, I mean, and Jessica, I guess I'm, I'm curious if you share my assessment here, is that they just want to get this goalpost moved so they can come right. back and have another bite at the apple immediately, which is what they're doing with the federal non-ban ban. I mean, exactly. Lindsey Graham was too brazen before the election, but now yeah. they're feeling emboldened and they're going to go for it. Oh, yeah, they're fully going for it. Um, one of the biggest anti-choice organizations in the country, Susan B. Anthony Pro-Life America, has made it very clear that that is their line in the sand for Republican presidential candidates. Um And again, the way that they're talking about it, they're talking about it as if this is something all Americans can agree on. We all agree that there should be some kind of restriction. No, we don't. And actually, the polls don't back that up. Um, But they are going to continue to put that messaging out there, say that they are being completely reasonable and, um, you know, looking for a middle ground. And what scares me is that they're really trying to redefine the middle ground, right? We've seen uh, folks like South Carolina's uh, Nancy Mace, Representative Nancy Mace, who has been doing the media rounds, talking about, oh, Republicans need to take it easy. They can't be so extreme on abortion. We all need to find a middle ground. And then she'll throw something in there like, like we can all agree on birth control access. Since when is birth control access? A controversy, right. They're really like, they're, they're doing this in a very specific, unfortunately, smart way that that reframes the middle reframes the conversation and we can't allow them to do that um and and uh, and and obviously like these are all once they achieve i mean we're we're very close to the point i think you made this point in 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 i don't know if it was today's or Mm -hmm. yesterday but we're we're more or less the entire south is essentially a uh, abortion is banned um uh uh, you know florida all all these states um and that's going to be the basis of their federal consensus ban we're going to bring both the union and the confederacy and we're going to uh you know and we're just going to come to some type of uh, a broad consensus is it your sense though i mean i i if you read the 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 mainstream media about Mm -hmm. this it feels like they're not they're just reporting it as if like you know it's a ban but there's exceptions and it's a middle ground and this and that but do you think that like the general public is is buying this i mean do you like how much of this is because i I, i'm just as an analogy and I, I don't mean to sort of like uh, diminish the the significance of, of, of this stuff because it's because it's it's not necessarily analogous. But the but the the dynamic of 
everyone was convinced that there was going to be this Republican wave because there was this narrative formed in the conventional wisdom and it, and it impacted the actual on the ground organizing and uh, distribution of money. You know, maybe if people didn't think there was going to be a, a Republican wave, they send more money to Mandela Barnes and we pick up another uh, Senate seat. But the point being is like it, the reality was very different. Is the the idea that there's some type of consensus around here or that people are finding some type of middle ground and they're they're doing exceptions. It's one thing for the Beltway media, the national media, whatever's left of it, to m sort of like present it in that way. But do people living in these states, do people around the country, are they buying into it or do they just simply, we don't hear from them? They're not buying into it. Uh, NARAL did a recent study that asked, do you think um, you know a 15-week ban, federal ban, is reasonable, common sense? Overwhelmingly, no. And if you go to really any of these states, right? The, the vast majority of, of voters, vast majority of Americans don't want abortion bans, don't support abortion restrictions, even in red states. And I think one of the biggest problems we're seeing with the, the mainstream media framing of all of this is if you read an article about abortion, you would get the sense that America is evenly split on this issue. You would get the sense that we are, you know, extraordinarily polarized on this issue. We're not. And as you said, the midterm showed it, right? Like you're seeing votes in Kansas and Kentucky. No, we are not split on this. Republicans want people to think that we're split on this because so much so much of their effort right now is about undermining de uh, democratic norms, right? What they're doing in Ohio with trying to change the standards around ballot measures. Um, they are going to pass these bans whether voters want them or not. And so it's really important to them to get the message out there that we're somehow split because the truth that this is a small group of extremist legislators passing these restrictions against the, the wishes of the vast majority of voters does not look good for, for them. Um, and so that messaging is incredibly important to, to that broader strategy. What's your sense of how to push back on that? I mean, I mean, obviously you're, you're, you're engaged in it, but, um, we, we're starting to see again, and like there, it, it, it seems to come in waves where there is more attention paid to some of these horrible instances where mm -hmm. these you know these bans in action lead to uh the the I, I don't know if it was a story out of florida just the other day about the, the this uh this couple that uh, their kid had their 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 baby had potter's syndrome yeah. and they had to carry to term and then literally just sit there for 90 minutes and watch the the baby yeah. uh asphyxiate uh because it, it could not breathe and they knew this would happen um and it has had incredibly it's done incredible mental harm to the family and to the, the, the a um is it is it the trying to present more of these uh stories is it um trying to work on the 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 mainstream press and sort of making them reevaluate how they assess what constitutes a compromise. I mean, where, sure. where, from your perspective, is the uh, the the best? Um, I don't know uh, ways in which to pursue this. Sure. Listen, those stories are horrific and really important, right? These are happening. This suffering is happening. This cruelty is happening. But my concern is, if we are only focusing on those stories, on those extremely tragic stories, you're giving Republicans the opportunity to say, okay, well, here, here's an exception for severe fetal abnormalities, and now we can all agree, right? No. Forcing someone to carry a pregnancy against their will, no matter what is going on with the pregnancy, no matter where they are in that pregnancy, is unjust. It's inhumane. And Republicans know it. If you look at a lot of these bills, right, the medical emergency exceptions, Almost every single one of them has language in there about the fact that it's not a medical emergency if there's a mental health condition. Specifically, they will say, if a doctor diagnoses someone as suicidal right. as a result of carrying a pregnancy that they're being forced to carry, that is not a medical emergency. They are anticipating the fact that women will become suicidal as a result of, of being forced to carry pregnancies. All of it is a horror story. All of it is a human rights violation, right? 
And to me, that is what we need to be focused on. It doesn't matter what the circumstances of the pregnancy are. No one should be forced to carry a pregnancy that they don't want, period. But that's the point is the is the they want you to have mental health ramifications because it's your punishment for being promiscuous or or for having sex outside of marriage or for pleasure or for romance or whatever. Um, I mean, like, uh, I I, I want to return to what you said about um, about birth control. Because we're seeing more and more efforts. I know, you know, this is kind of a little bit, it's, it's, it's completely related to abortion. But, um, like, that they're going to try to ramp up efforts to control the IUD, the birth control pill, the morning after pill. Maybe that comes first. Mm -hmm. Just, like, what you're seeing on the ground about that. Because, clearly for me, there's a pattern of the methods of birth control that are in the woman or the person who can get pregnancy control, that's the stuff that they're going to come after first. And I think it's going to come more quickly than people anticipate. Oh, yeah, they're 100% already there, right? This is not something that's happening in the future. This is something that they are already doing. They have been laying the groundwork for years to um, call things like IUDs, emergency contraception, abortifacients, because they argue that um, it prevents the implantation of a fertilized egg, and therefore that's an abortion, right? And that was part of what the Hobby Lobby Supreme Court case was about. And so that's already enshrined. Like, we, we have that. We know that they are arguing that. Um, then you have groups like Students for Life, who I see quoted constantly in the mainstream media, and I never see anyone ask them about the fact that on their website, under birth control, they list almost every single form of birth control, unless it's a barrier method, as abortion, right? They believe birth control is abortion, and that is what they're going after. And the way we're going to see it happen, I think people have this thing in their mind where they're like, Republicans aren't going to turn around tomorrow and make abortion, uh, make birth control illegal. That's not how it works. They're not going to pass some bill that says birth control is illegal. They do the slow chipping away process that they did with abortion, right? They'll come after minors first. They'll come after young people. Um, and they'll make it harder for insurance to cover it, as they did with Hobby Lobby. And so it's just that slow chipping away process. And if even if birth control is legal, if no one can access it, it's not really legal. Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, it seems like all of this is simply, this is a dynamic, not, uh, there's no, the, the end game here is I think hard for a lot of frankly, normal people who are not fundamentalists, um, to really, I think, be able to see it clearly. I mean, this is all part and parcel. And one other thing I wanted to ask you about was, um, there it, it's, there's an interesting dynamic that seems to be forming where there is a a relationship between the sort of the the trans legislation that people are passing that these the Republican legislators are passing and they're using uh, anti-abortion bills as a way of sort of like sneaking uh, maybe sneaking's not the right word but sort of shepherding a- anti-trans like this is. And when we talk about this in the context, too, of, uh, of birth control, so much of this just is is really I mean, it almost sounds, um, you know, hackneyed at this point. But this is all just sort of about reinforcing a specific patriarchy and a set of gender norms that the Bible tells us we have to follow. Exactly. It's about reinforcing those traditional uh, traditional gender roles and gender norms, both in terms of women need to stay in the home and be pregnant. And there is a gender binary and that's it. And of course, those laws, all of those laws are about bodily autonomy, right? Doing away with the notion of bodily autonomy. And the other thing that's going on strategically for them is that they know, again, that abortion rights are so popular, right? they don't really think that they, they know that they don't have the support when it comes to abortion rights. They're hoping that if they can appeal to anti-trans bias, that somehow voters will be more likely to buy into this or, or be less furious um, about the laws. And hopefully that's not the case, but we know that the, the anti-trans bias, even unfortunately, like in the feminist community on the left is, is still there. Um, and so conservatives know that these issues are attached. And that's why it's so important for us to treat these issues as attached and connected. Um, all right. Lastly, let me ask you this. The, um, it seems to me that at one point, once they get 
to uh, the level of abortion bans that they want. And I don't know what the ceiling is in terms of how many states. Maybe it's 24. Maybe, you know, maybe it could be a federal ban. Um, I think that's, well, it's not inconceivable, uh, you know, if they have three um, uh, branches of government. Um, but what about the idea of, like, crossing the state borders? What about the idea of mailing? I mean, uh, the Biden administration made it pretty clear that that they believe that, that the post office is authorized to deliver uh, mm-hmm. medical abortion across uh, state lines. Do you have a sense of where, like, uh, 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 is there any been any tea leaves as to how the Supreme Court would, let's say, ultimately rule on a case where a state says our authority to, if you're a, Virgi- you know, if you're a Georgian, uh, if you're an Alabaman, and you yeah. go to get an abortion in New York City, we can, uh, w- we can put you in jail, uh, mm-hmm. or if you send any uh, thing through the mail, we can put you in jail or we can put them in jail. I mean, do you have a sense of like, is there any tea leaves as to where the court has been on there? Are there any cases that give any like sort of like signs as to how various members of the court would rule on this? I wish, I wish I knew. I feel like I don't trust any of my, when it comes to the Supreme Court, I don't trust anything I think anymore. Um, We do know, though, that if Republicans win the presidency, they will be able to reinterpret the Comstock Act, right? Biden says it's legal to to ship abortion medication. A Republican president will say it's not. And the important thing to remember about the Comstock Act is that it's not just um, abortion medication that would be impacted, but the tools that you use for a procedural abortion. And so that would be illegal as well. And so all of a sudden, New York abortion providers can't have their tools shipped to them. That would be illegal. So, and they they are working on this. Over- oh, so they could, even in states where abortion's legal, they could say nothing associated with mm-hmm. an abortion can be mailed through the mail, exactly. like, like uh, pot's legal in New York uh, yep. state, but you cannot mail it to nope. um, the, okay. Yeah, it's absurd. And the other thing that they're doing in pro-choice states is they're going um, town by town, uh, specifically in border towns and towns that border uh, an anti-choice state. And they are passing anti-abortion ordinances through local governments in pro-choice states saying we're going to ban abortion by town in pro-choice states and basically take all of the activist energy and effort and force people to sort of have these fights in pro-choice states as well. Um, so they're coming at it from from all fronts, really. Is the Democratic Party doing a good job in making them pay a political price for this? Uh, I mean, <laughs> my biggest gripe at the moment really is is the messaging. I feel like we are accepting their framework for the conversation, right? Um, Abortion wins elections and Democrats are still treating it as if it's this, you know, issue that they need to be careful about, that they need to tiptoe around, that they need to, you know, say all of this stuff about, oh, we just want to restore Roe. That's, That's it. We're not going for anything further, right? Have a little backbone. Like the, the voters are coming out for this. Treat it, treat it like the winning issue that it is. It, you know, Roe didn't protect us. We, we need something stronger than that. We need to be clear that abortion under any circumstances is a, is a human rights issue. Um, and honestly, this is part of why I'm doing the newsletter. We need to be talking about it every single day. Every day that I don't see the president, um, you know, Democrats out there talking about this, talking about how extreme this is. You're talking about half the population has lost their their human rights. Um, to me, there's there's no bigger issue. Um, the is there a divide? I mean, I, I can't help but think uh, that the same sort of problems that we have with even when it comes to the debt ceiling, when it comes to a whole host of 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 our politics, like, you know, Minnesota, for instance, uh, has had just an amazing session. And I was just reading a piece about it. And they uh, a local reporter made the, the specific point of saying we have a lot of younger politicians here mm-hmm. who have a very different perspective 
even if the you know in their heart of hearts their ideological um uh, there there's not as much ideological difference as one would think maybe but they say that their perspective on what their job is and and oh. and what they should do with power when they get it is very different from the generation that preceded them and nationally we still have that generation i mean uh, I, I know you know this, but for a lot of people listening to this uh, um, uh, podcast, they don't know that, you know, Hillary Clinton back in 2004 was one of the biggest voices for sort of like compromising on mm -hmm. this issue, um, at least rhetorically anyways. Yeah. And, you know, this that has that has bad effects because it makes the job that you're trying to do now and making people understand where we are that much harder because you're unwinding stuff. Is it, is it your sense that within this sort of like in this set of issues that we're still stuck in this mentality from the mid nineties? I think to a certain extent, yes, I think it's gotten better, but as you said, this, this framing of safe, legal and rare, right? <laughs> we are still seeing the after effects of that, right? That was such a, a powerful thing that Republicans today are saying, well, look, now Demo what happened to safe, legal and rare? They don't want compromise. They're so extreme. It's not extreme. There's nothing extreme about saying pregnancy is too complicated to legislate. It it just is. We see this every single day. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that we're still sort of seeing the after effects of that. And I think when you look at a lot of you know the big mainstream organizations, they're trying to um, shift and 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 change that messaging and change the way that they're thinking about it and understanding now just how much uh, abortion wins elections. But yes, like local young activists have been there for a long time, right? They know their communities. They know that that people support abortion rights. They know that we can talk about this um, in a non-defensive way. Uh, and I think we are starting to see people take their cues from them, which is great. How hard is it for, for, for the sort of the major uh, sort of long time, um, institutional, uh, abortion rights, uh, groups to make that turn? Because as you, as you mentioned it, like I imagine they were really impacted by, you know, the most prominent, uh, uh, female politician that we had basically in the democratic party, sort of shifting the rhetoric because that becomes a cue for donors, I would imagine, to these organizations. And I also would imagine that the donors to these organizations largely are, you know, older. That's when people have more money. Uh, uh, and that that influences how they operate. And it, it just has this sort of horrible trickle down effect. A hundred percent, right? When you look at, and listen, these organizations are, doing great work. Like I'm not going to shit on big organizations, but yeah, if you look at boards of directors, if you look at donors, right, these are people who come from a certain generation who feel like they know precisely like what that messaging should be. And that being too radical, that being too um, aggressive, whatever that means will, that, that will pay a price for that. Right. We know that, but I am still very hopeful because so many of these fights now are really happening on a local level, but it does mean, and this is why at the newsletter and, you know, on social media, I'm constantly telling people support your local abortion funds, support independent abortion providers, right? These big organizations, they're, they're great. They're doing a lot of great work, but they have a lot of money, right? <laughs> right? Like who doesn't have a lot of money are the independent providers, um, the, the local abortion funds who really are on the ground in their, not just states, but in their small communities, doing this work um really appreciate your time today jessica valenti sure. we will put a link uh, to uh the abortion everyday newsletter on substack uh thanks so much thanks for having me thank you